can go ahead and get started if you're ready. Oh, sure. Okay. Sure. Um, I've got the tape started, and so I'm just going to ask you. I thought we could start with some questions about your early life and then just work forward. Sure. Um, so I wanted to start by asking you when and where you were born. In Goodland, Indiana. And how far is that from Lafayette? 45 miles. Okay, that was very close by then. Um, I read somewhere that you had 10 brothers and sisters. Is right. That right. Okay, what what order the, the were you? To, the total was 10. Okay, so you were of the yeah. 10. What, were you a middle? I came fourth. Number four? Okay. <laughs> and that isn't a trite thing. <laughs> That I came for. Yes, it's <coughs> quite an accomplishment, ten children. <laughs> what were your parents' names? Uh, John W. Johnson and Helen Johnson. Okay. And you were born in 1906, is that right? That's correct. Where did you go to high school? Goodland, Goodland, Indiana. Okay. And what made you decide to come to Purdue? Oh, I'm sure that the thing that excited me about Purdue was that my uncle had graduated from Purdue. Okay. And he became quite a famous person. Who was he? Hartley Rowe, R-O-W-E. And my mother's name was Helen Rowe okay. before she was married. Okay. And I might mention, because this be of interest to you, my uncle Hartley Rowe uh, became one of the engineers under General Gothios in building the Panama Canal. My goodness, that's amazing. So he he was an influence in your deciding to go to Purdue because yes. you heard about mm -hmm. him going there. That's right. So he was an engineer also. Yes, he was. Okay. Interesting. And he was a a very wonderful person, and of course, us children just thought the sun rose and set. Oh yeah, <laughs> I have I have an aunt that I feel that way about, so I understand that. Well, so you you had um, this uncle who was involved in the Panama Canal, and so that obviously was an influence in your early years. To go to Purdue, yeah, yes. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, did you always know that you wanted to go into aeronautical engineering? I know it was a very new field at the time. It was a very new field, but uh, also I was very mechanically inclined. Mm -hmm. Automobiles were just be just coming. Mm -hmm. They hadn't fully arrived when I did. Uh, you know the Oldsmobile with the engine under the seat? Oh, uh -huh. And you cranked it on the side? Uh-huh. <laughs> I, I, and I, I was so interested in all those things that I knew all the automobile names wow. of all the early cars. So what kind of car did your family have when you were young? We had a Studebaker. Oh, did you work on that sometimes? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was the only one that, that would work on an really? automobile, but I did. That's a nice one to work on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you remember them? Oh, yes. I've heard of them. I've never, you know, I, had, I don't have one, but yeah, yeah, well, they're was, very nice cars. It was a large uh, touring car. And uh, it would hold all those children. And they were made in Indiana, right? They were, they were yes, made in Indiana. South Bend. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, um, one of the things I did to prepare for today is I looked you up in the yearbook, 
and the, the old debris yearbook at Purdue, 1941, right? And, no, I'm sorry, 1930 was the year you graduated, right? Yes. And I saw that you were a member of several different organizations while you were at Purdue. Yeah. What, what are some of your memories of, of participating in, uh, like, the student organizations and such? Well, I, I enjoyed the military okay. association through ROTC. Mm -hmm. And the commanding officer at that time was... Uh, Uh, let's see. He now has a monument in Washington for him. Uh, it'll come to me uh, what his name was. But uh, that, no, I didn't quite get it. But anyway... Um, I love to drive those big tractors. Oh, uh-huh. That would pull the guns around. Wow. Uh, Purdue had a big armory. Uh-huh. And uh, 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 another student and I were sort of assigned to the big tractors. Oh, okay. So that fulfilled my ambition. <coughs> You've always been interested in trying to drive all sorts of different things, or well, all sorts machines. Of things. Yes, especially machines. Okay, very interesting. Uh, I, I had followed a four-horse team oh. so long uh -huh. that I wanted something more interesting. An improvement. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to clean up after the others. <laughs> a member of the Acacia organization? Yes. What was that? I don't know anything about that organization. The, the Acacia is a fraternity. Oh, okay. It's a Masonic fraternity. Oh, uh-huh. It said something about annual water fights. Do you remember any of those? The uh, annual water fight? No. No? You don't I didn't get... I wasn't a good swimmer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you avoided that, huh? Any of your professors when you were at Purdue? Yes. <clears throat> Pat, Pappy, we called him Daddy. Um, and he was a, as a professor in, um, of mechanical engineering. Was that was that Young? G yeah. G A Young. That was okay. A, that so, was it. So the students called him Pappy or Daddy. Pappy. Interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about A.A. A. Potter? Did you, did you know him? Yes. Potter was, uh, he, he was a different school, uh -huh. but uh, he, were, he had written uh, done quite a little writing, I think. Yes, he has written a lot. Yeah, and we knew, we knew him very well. He was famous. Yeah, he, um, he was. Among students. So did he ever spend time with the students, or was he more of an administrator? Well, I think it, it a, uh, that we'd, we'd have these, what did they call them, get-togethers. And a professor would then lead the group in discussion, and... Uh, and uh, he, he was always involved. Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, you were talking about the ROTC. Did, did, you, did you have to participate in the um, inspections that they did, the regular inspections of the military? <laughs> that came later. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but when you... When you were at Purdue, did all of the men students have to be in the ROTC? No. They didn't have to? No. Okay. It was optional. Okay. Okay. Maybe that came later, too, because I think there was a time when they all had to go through that. Probably. Probably, yeah. 
for World War II or yeah, something like that. Yeah, for World War II, I think. Oh, in the 60s during the Vietnam War. Oh, yeah. so it lasted a long time. Okay. Wow. I didn't realize it lasted that long. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the other things I learned about you was that you were on the debate team while you were at Purdue. Is that right? Yes. Do you, do you remember any of the things that you debated? Any of the issues that you debated? I suppose it was current, current events, mm -hmm. current type of events. I, I saw that they mentioned a couple of them in the yearbook, and I wanted to ask if you were debating any of these. One of them was about the Paris Peace Act. The Paris Peace Act? No, I no? didn't. What about the ownership of hydroelectric plants? That came later. Okay. I'm sure. Abolishing the system of trial by jury? No. No. <laughs> We'll give up on that, that line of questioning. Um, well, one of the things I thought was really fascinating about you was that you were involved in such different types of organizations because you were also involved in an honorary literary society, the Kappa Phi Sigma. How did you become involved in that? Do you remember? Debating, I think. That's what led to that? Mm -hmm. What about the Purdue Little Theater? I think just seeing my visage would give them a laugh. <laughs> I'm just a farm boy. <laughs> did you did, did you act in any performances or anything? No, we, no. I didn't have time for it. The reason being that I had to work my way through. Right. So I was engaged at the student union carrying trays and ser okay. serving right. all the time that I was a student. Did you go directly to Purdue after graduating high school? Or did you work for a while? Well, I think, my, I think I stayed out a year first. You did. And then I had to stay out one more year during the, during the uh, course at Purdue. Okay. Get, get a little money. Right, you were earning your way through. Yeah. Right. Okay. So you said you worked in the union. Was That was a fairly new building then, wasn't it? Yes. It, it was the largest building on the campus, I think, at that time. Yeah. And uh, it served meals. Mm -hmm. And I was one of them who carried the big trays and all that. Yeah. Sort of thing. I still eat over there at lunch most days. Yeah. They still have... They still serve food there. Uh -huh. There's students who work there serving food. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, you were also involved in the Purdue Independent Association, which was a student rights organization, the Purdue Independent Association. It was a, it was a student rights organization. Do you remember anything about that? No. Okay. It just... The description in the yearbook said that it represented the political interests of the student body and the social interests. And one of the things they talked about was better housing for students and things like that. So I was lucky to. <laughs> <laughs> Did you live at home? I'm sorry. Did, Did you, you live? live at home when you went to school? Mm -hmm. Did you live on campus? At Purdue. Yeah. Uh -huh. You live at Purdue. Uh, uh, Grant Avenue. Grant Street. Street. Right. Okay. Was that off campus? In the in the student housing or Yeah, it was on the south border of the Okay. Okay. I think. Uh huh. So you never stayed in any of the resident halls or anything like that? No. Okay. I I, I, I rented a room, I think it was. That's interesting because I always wondered if they made freshmen stay on campus or not. But they must not have no, they didn't. Okay. Huh. Interesting. They make them stay on campus now? I, I don't know. Do they? Um, I don't think they make them anymore. They used to. It's yeah. recommended. But I don't think it's mandatory. Mm -hmm. a, lo a lot. We have more students now, I think, than we've ever had before. What is the enrollment? Uh, 39,000. 39,000 students. So 
it, they've had trouble finding housing for everybody, so that's part of the problem with that. But, um, let's see. I was going to ask you about your athletics while you were at Purdue because it said you were involved in boxing. Yes. Do you remember anything about that? Did yes. The reason that I become involved in that was my father. I thought that, uh, that we ought to be able to defend ourselves. And as there were four boys of us at home, so he got boxing gloves and he'd have us box each other. <laughs> sit on the side of the and laugh. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Did any of your brothers and sisters go to Purdue? No. No. Oh, yes. Max. Oh, Max did? Okay. Max Johnson. He went to Purdue and graduated from Purdue. Okay. Was he all, did he also go into engineering? I think so. Okay. Do you remember when you were involved in athletics, did you know Piggy Lambert? The name's familiar. He's, he's kind of become famous in athletics these days, and I was wondering if he was involved with coaching any of the teams you were on. Because you were involved with baseball too, right? Well, I, I was involved. The only reason that I was involved in... Uh, boxing was I could do that right. at 5 o'clock in the afternoon was the only vacancy I had in time. And so I would stop by the gymnasium and practice boxing. Oh, okay. And then we had golden gloves and all that sort of thing. Do you remember the athletic carnivals? They, were, they had yearly athletic carnivals. I was reading about them and it sounded like the students would box each other until there was like a champion each year. I don't believe it was that serious. Okay. It was just more for fun. It was more <clears throat> the boxing of a, that I was involved in as a contest was under ROTC. Oh, okay. Okay, that makes sense. Well, whenever you played for the baseball team, what position did you play? Do you remember? I didn't get to play. Oh, you didn't. You didn't play. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't any time for. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um. One of the things that it's been said about the class of 1930 was that they were tradition makers. I was reading the statements that the class put in the yearbook and it said, we're tradition makers. We've made all of these traditions while we've been at Purdue. So I was gonna ask you if you remembered any particular Purdue traditions from your time there. Yes. Bring back the old oak and bucket. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> that's, still, that's still very much a tradition. What about the cords? Did, did, did you wear the corduroys back then? The corduroy pants that you decorate? Did that, was that a tradition then? I don't know. Okay. I think it was, it, it was either that or overalls. Okay. <laughs> so. Maybe that came later because for a while students would, it was sort of like graffiti on their pants. They would put the oh, no. organizations and things no, there on. No, we didn't. Yep. Didn't do that. In that at all. It was probably the later classes yes. know, who did that. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, what is your fondest memory of your time at Purdue? I'll give you some time to think about it. Well, uh, I think your fondest memory is pretty girls. <laughs> <laughs> do they have a lot of pretty girls? <laughs> I guess the male students have all, always outnumbered the females, though, so, you yeah, know. They did. Yeah. I thought I didn't have much of a chance. Really? <laughs> did you meet your wife after you graduated? 
Yes, yes. She, she uh, was from Tennessee. Oh, uh-huh. So How did you meet her? Accidentally. Okay. Was it in Indiana that you met her? No, it was in Wyoming. Oh, okay. It, it's a story in itself almost. Well, tell us about it. Uh, all right. But, uh, it, her brother was uh, in the Air Corps, or in the infantry. And he became a general in the infantry, Van Bond. And in fact, he served under Bradley, and when, when the war was over, he gave me his pistol. Oh, wow. And I still have it. Wow. Except I've told my son, my son in Cheyenne, that it will be his. So it will accumulate history. Because Van became a general in the infantry. And that's not an easy thing to accomplish. How did I meet mm -hmm. Ruth? Some, a year, uh, several years before, Van Bond was assigned to the, to the military at Cheyenne. Oh, uh-huh. And he served there and married a Cheyenne girl. And uh, so uh, Ruth naturally was welcome any time that, uh, and, and so she, he, he of course had not stayed there because he was in the military and he was moved to different base and so on. But uh, she knew that people would know her there. And, so uh, while she was on a sorority uh, get-together at Colorado Springs, she came down to Cheyenne and uh, visited with the, with the people who, whose daughter Van had married. And they were ranch people, wonderful ranch people. And so I had a lot of friends in the ranching world. But they were attracted to me because I was test pilot and so on, you know. Because you were what? A test pilot and oh. a fire and so on. So I, I knew all those people, knew them well. And uh, a party was given while she was visiting uh, the, the people whose daughter Van had married. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was on the, uh, on the ranch, and these ranch people were invited to this party. And so she came as a part of it. And uh, I was supposed to escort another girl, a different girl. And so, uh, but uh, in the course of the evening, we all, the younger tribes got together, you know, and we're all visiting. So, uh, I got to know her a little bit then. But it's pretty chancy, you know. Uh, you never th would think something would come of that. But during the evening, I asked her if she would write her telephone number on my sleeve. Uh -huh. And she, 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 she very foolishly did. And it was the 
right number. <laughs> answering your question one night. Um, oh, I was asking about your first, the first experience you had with aviation, and you were talking about your friend yes. who would land his plane at Purdue. Yeah. When was the first time? As farmers, we didn't have any money, so we couldn't have flown before we were self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that, uh, I guess the first was in training. Okay. Yeah. Well, that happened in an odd way. When I was graduating from Purdue, there were other men who were taking trips to Chinook Field, mm -hmm. Illinois, to take physical exams. And I thought, well, what's this physical exam business? Uh, because I'm a healthy farm boy. I'm fairly rugged and so on. So I thought I could pass that. And I went over and I did pass it. And uh, that, that, that steered me on the way. Next thing I knew, after graduating from Purdue, I was on a train headed for Marshfield, California. Oh, okay. For pilot training. I guess you did pass those yeah. exams. <laughs> yeah. Well, did you ask to be involved in, in the piloting aspect of it, or did they assign that to you? No, I, the, the examination was for pilot. Okay, I yeah. see. Yeah. Interesting. And the, the, one of the courses that I took was aviation oh, at okay. Purdue. 
And the professor's name was Haskins. Yes, George. Professor Haskins. That's right. So that must have been one of the first classes in, it was. in that area in the yeah. country. I think he'd only been there one term before or so. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we had to design a crankshaft for an engine or something like that. Oh, wow. As a test. And uh, then, of course, the training was at Marshfield. And incidentally, we were, we were trained by West Pointers. involved far more than flight training because the West Pointers were used to uh, the, the regime that they had learned at West Point, which was pretty strict. And uh, so uh, they were handy at giving out geeks. And to do that, they wear white gloves when they inspected the barracks, and if they found a hole in a in a bedstead, they put their white glove in there and see see <laughs> ten gigs. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> so they would punish you if they you were handy with the gigs. Mm. Gigs. <laughs> Did you have to go through like a boot camp when yeah. you did? Yeah, that's yeah. boot camp. Okay. Mm -hmm. Had you already had to do something similar to that at, in the ROTC, or no. did they not no. make you go through anything no. like that? Okay. No. okay. Um, well, tell me a little bit about being involved in, the, in World War II and what you were doing with aviation then. World War II became in started in 41. Right. And I was test pilot for United Airlines. You had already started working for them. Yeah. Do you remember that when you first started? What you well, well I, I, I first started working. Well, that, that goes back a ways. Uh, if you want it, I'll tell you what it was. See, after, uh, <clears throat> after I graduated from Purdue, it was depression time. Nobody had money. And the reason that they didn't keep any of our graduates in the military is the military didn't have any money. And, uh, it was called the Air Corps then. And uh, so they turn, turned us loose. And uh, we still didn't have any money. Yeah. <laughs> and, and diversion time. So Larry Modell was one of these in the same fix that I was. And uh, he had a car and I didn't. So Larry was a good, good fellow, and uh, I enjoyed him very much. And so I shared his car with him. You see, and to get a little bit of art immediately after graduating, uh, we returned to Colorado, and at Whitmore, Colorado. There was a little factory up on the top of the mountains because they were using the aspen trees uh, for their toys. And uh, it's a very workable wood. And so we got a job, and I don't think we were, I think we had I think we were paid with meals. <laughs> I don't think I don't think any money changed. <laughs> 
<laughs> but we made toys and for the rest of the year. Up and we entered in the fall, and by spring, that was over. So Larry and I left in his Dodge uh, Roadster, searching for work, and then we parted. And, I, and since it's about me, I guess I'd better stick to the phone. Uh, and a part of my search, uh, I became acquainted with Clyde Shockley, who was in charge of the airport at Muncie, Indiana. And some of you know that Muncie, Indiana, was a, really an afterthought of Ball Brothers, mm -hmm. the glass people. And they supported everything. Oh. And the, the airport uh, was supported by them, and they were wonderful people. And uh, they, they hired me to be a grand, grand school instructor. Oh, uh -huh. So I instructed both uh, the Ball Brothers uh, in, in aviation. Wow. Ground school work, you know, calculating distances and speeds and so mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And they were wonderful people. I, I, I was very fortunate. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, summertime came, and they had acquired an amphibian airplane. It was a single engine amphibian. Could land on water, or you could, if you pull the wheels up, you know. I land on water or land on land, either one. And the <clears throat> Lake Wawa Sea was a, and you're maybe somewhat yeah, afraid of summer camp there. <laughs> you did? Yeah, I did. You did? Yeah. Well, I was the pilot that was flying that uh, amphibian during the summer. I charged, I think it's five dollars, something like that. And I had, had to give them a ticket uh, and take them for a ride, you know. And, and it was a nice little airplane. And I had to maintain it myself and uh, fly it and uh, account for the money and all that kind of thing. Anyway, it was a delight, a delightful summer. That was the summer of 32 uh, of the World's Fair of Chicago. And this little amphibian airplane was such that if, if a group wanted to fly into and land at the lake at Chicago, I could taxi up on the ramp after landing in the water. They could get out and go to the World's Fair, right. which they did. So, and, and that was just one of the activities. The other was just taking people for rides, sightseeing. And I spent the summer there and, and could see that this couldn't become a permanent thing because the summer was going to be over. Right. So I landed at uh, Midway Airport at Chicago with it and went in to see the head of National Air Transport. Uh -huh. And the 
the chief pilot was Walter Adams, spelled A-D-D-E-M-S. <clears throat> a, a wonderful person. And he went out and looked at my airplane and he said, Did you free this in here today? I said, Yeah, I said, nice airplane. Well, he said, and he was sort of skeptical, but he, he said, Well, if you can fly that airplane, uh, you can appear here next Monday. Wow. And go to work. Isn't that something? <laughs> yeah, and that's what happened. Of course, they get, they got another pilot to come in and do the flying for them for the rest of the summer. Okay. <clears throat> so what kind of plane were you flying for them, for the National Air? What kind of planes were you flying? Ford Tri-Motors. Oh, uh-huh. Tri-Motor Ford. I had flown that in the military, too. The Fokker trimotor and the Ford trimotor. Okay. Throwing them both. <coughs> Did you have a particular favorite plane that you like to fly? I, I guess the Ford trimotor. It was big. I liked the big things. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to. I could see air transport coming. It wasn't there yet. People didn't fly. Uh, to, de to encourage people to fly was a major operation. Uh, seldom would we have over three or four people aboard, even in the Ford Tram order. Was it mostly because there weren't regular airline schedules then, or was it because it was too expensive? Fear. Oh, it was the fear, fear of flying. Yeah. Interesting. Fear of flying. Flying was new to them, to, to, the, to the public. And uh, it, it took considerable encouragement within the family, say, to have one of the family fly mm -hmm. because they were afraid, afraid of flying. <clears throat> and that fear prevailed for several years and so that even in a Ford Tri-Motor we'd often not have over four passengers wow. or five. We could carry seven or eight. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, so uh, aviation was in a, a heavy struggle, and uh, that really, when I look back on my experience in aviation, it was hardship. We were trying to sell a new product, which the insurance companies would not insure. If they knew you were going to fly, they said they would cancel your insurance. Oh my goodness. That, that's the kind of thing that aviation faced in the early days. And uh, one of the people that kind of broke the back of that sort of thinking was Will, Will Rogers. And he was a wonderful fellow. And uh, we just thought the world of Will Rogers. My whole family, radios had just come in a little bit. You know, if you listen carefully, crystal sets. Oh, uh-huh. Oh, yeah. It was a crystal set. And, uh, and we'd hear Will Rogers over the crystal set, and uh, hey, um, really, you see, early aviation didn't have any communication. It didn't have radio. It didn't have any wave. 
for the pilot to communicate across the ground station when we started. Uh, you wonder, well, how in the world does this thing get going anyway? That was a big question. It was tough. Very tough. On, uh, When the air mail was canceled by Jim Farley and uh, President Roosevelt, and that's an odd, odd little story. We were doing fairly well, struggling, as we were with four tremors. But United, not United Airlines, but National, or no, Boeing Air Transport. Boeing Air Transport operated from up and down the West Coast and then across to Chicago. Okay. And that was all. It didn't go on any further. National Air Transport that I was uh, flying with the uh, Trimotor Forbes were flying into Newark. New York did not have an airport. Uh, the military had an airport, but uh, Floyd Bennett, I think that's called. But um, uh, not, but, but New York did not have an airport. Coming to well, I was I was asking you how you got involved with United Airlines. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Well, that that happened because I was with National Air Transport. And it, right. it changed to United, right? Is that right? Yeah. Uh, Am I skipping? And I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you the parts you may want. Okay. Good. The air mail was canceled by. That's where we were. Right? Yes. It was canceled by Jim Farley and uh, President Roosevelt because, and the reason why it was canceled, I guess, was the, the, the Boeing Air Transport, well, the Boeing Company, had built the first low-wing airplane oh. with retractable landing gear and uh, territorial passengers. I should have brought it. I had one on my desk. I could brought it, but there's a lot of pictures. This stuff here. So you get to see it anyway if you want to. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> we, we'll go over that later. Um, you were talking about the, the cancel of the airmail. Oh, yes. Uh, so all the airlines were shut down. And there weren't, weren't many airlines anyway. There's National Air Transport, Boeing Air Transport, and uh, uh, TWA was called something, but it wasn't TWA. Uh, uh, their first name, I, I don't remember their first name. And America. We all met in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, to try to flesh this thing out. But first, before that, all the personnel were, were laid off oh, wow. because there's no income. So all the pilots and all the 
I guess we had Sturgis's maybe by that time. We were all laid out. And the only thing that I was concerned about was I was laid out. <laughs> <laughs> Were you taking the mail on your flights in addition to passengers? Yes. Okay. okay. As a matter of fact, it started on it right. Okay. But the, the, carrying the mail came first. Oh, uh-huh. And then one or two passengers. And it finally got up to four or five passengers. But that, that was heavy work, getting people to adopt aviation. Uh, every trick in the book was used to try to interest them in flying, uh, but they were afraid of it. They were afraid of flying. So, uh, part of your story is the overcoming of fear on the part of the public mm -hmm. for aviation. We were constantly working to try to overcome the fear of the of the of anyone fly that would fly. I, I require one time four of us co co pilots were assigned to New York to sell tickets, if we could. Pretty desperate when they got, so that they got the co pilots to come into New York and try to sell tickets. And one of their best salesmen tried to teach us how to sell tickets and the way you did it. Pretty much, Dewey, Dewey was the name of the fellow that was teaching it. She bound your way into the manager's office and sweep past the secretary because she'd stop you. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she had words to stop you. <laughs> Sorry. 
charge of Dodd Field. So I learned to know him very well. And uh, <clears throat> and I liked him very, very much. He was, and he now has an honorarium on you in Washington. Oh, he's the one you were talking about yeah. earlier. Okay. Black one. Uh, okay. That's the one. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So is he the one who... Um, but the other one, who was uh, uh, at Purdue, uh, Lachlan was not that man. I, I'll think of the other one okay. before long. Is he the one who introduced you to General Lyons? Or? Yes, okay. yes. That is a strange thing. Here I was, uh, only assigned to Dodd Field, I'd probably been there maybe a year. A uh, shaved tail, second lieutenant. And the commanding general of the whole Air Corps needed to make a tour of the, of, of the Eighth Corps area. Who did they pick? <laughs> a shaved tail second lieutenant <laughs> to fly a Fokker tri-motor. It's an honor. I thought, my gosh, a captain or major or something should be head of this thing. But anyway, I didn't question him. You did what you were supposed to do, and, and all right. So Sergeant Lee was my co-pilot. A uh, very able young fellow, and uh, so we took off in a Fokker tri motor with General Wyden. And it turned out that uh, probably I was the right choice, and I'll tell you why. Um, and we went to Marfa, Texas, and then to El Paso, Texas, and to Albuquerque. And the next stop was at uh, uh, Las Vegas. Not Las Vegas, New Mexico. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah. And then on up to uh, Pueblo, and then on up to... Cheyenne, where there was a base, Fort D.A. Russell at Cheyenne. Well, anyway, uh, when we landed at, uh, at uh, Las Vegas, New Mexico, and we put, put up for a night, and we chucked the airplane down and tied the airplane down and all that sort of thing, you know. But during the night, the wind came up, and it got the airplane to move enough that the it caught the outer aileron of that airplane and broke a hinge, wow. an outer hinge that the aileron would killed on, you know, and uh, uh, the reason that they, I say they were lucky that in a way that they did choose me, because I'd been a farm boy and an and a auto mechanic, and uh, I realized that we could fix that, mm -hmm. so we did that. Sergeant Lee and I took the hinge off and took it down to town, and we found a welder that could weld aluminum. Wow. <laughs> and they want probably 10 welders and maybe 100 welders in the United States that could weld aluminum. Oh, that was lucky. And we found one that could. So he welded a part for us, and we put 
back on their airplane, and nobody ever knew the difference, you know. Wow. Uh, we didn't tell anybody, and nobody knew the difference. Because the rules were, you know, if you do something like that to an airplane, you would probably be cashier out of the service. Because uh, it's supposed to go through channels. Mm -hmm. Well, you saved them a lot of money with that repair. Well, it would have stopped the whole operation. Yeah. And uh, so nobody knew the difference, and we repaired that, and that flew on up to Cheyenne, and where he inspected everything up there. Well, anyway. That's the reason why I say it was lucky, maybe, that they chose a farm boy mm -hmm. that had mechanical experience. Absolutely. To, to, but that's the reason, because yes. nobody else would have fixed it. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've seen so many changes in aviation throughout your life, and you've been involved in a lot of improvements in aviation. What do you think has been the most crucial improvement in aviation over time? Well, naturally, communication came first. Mm -hmm. An airplane would take off, and for a long time, we had no communication with the ground station. And they didn't know where we were, we were or what our problems were or anything of the kind. That was the early day of aviation. Was that around the mid to late 1930s when yeah. they started using radio? No, I think the first... Yes, but... Let's see. We did not have radio on any, any communication on those airplanes that was flying for General Lashman. Mm -hmm. uh, communications have not come in yet. You had it at home, a crystal set. You people at home were res listening to a crystal set. Radio had not yet hit its stride. And, uh, so, uh, probably it was 1932 or thereabouts before we had any radio communication. But that, it's about that time. Yeah. That's frightening to think about. Yeah. You know, you're just alone up there. Yeah. And, and the passengers are with you. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> you had to trust your pilot a lot. <laughs> well, I was, I was talking earlier about you've, you've won a lot of awards and you've been honored in, from your many achievements. and. I was wondering what you feel your personal proudest achievement has been towards aviation. Well, <clears throat> I brought something for you. Okay. But I thought maybe you'd want to take with you. It's in here, I think.
by me. Oh, wow. Uh, I have been writing for magazines uh, and uh, not magazines, but a magazine, Air Transport. Uh -huh. I'd write our articles for them. And then I developed you asked me the ask a question again. I was asking you what your proudest achievement was. This is it. Was that for the DI thing or this tells you how an airplane should be flown. Oh. Wow. And it revolutionized the way airplanes were being flown. Uh, this has established the standard the world over now. That's amazing. And so you'll be interested when you see it. Very much. Uh, to see what detail we went into at that time. Um, uh, I had been writing some mag some articles for Air Transport magazine. And this uh, man by the name of Fowler was the head of it at that time. And uh, so I'd write these, how, how to do this and how to do that with uh, airplanes, landing crosswinds and, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the problems were. And uh, out of it, finally came that, and that's a, that's a, per, that's permanent now. I mean, it, that could last forever, they say. I don't know whether it could or not. But what I do want to say to you is the methods, the flight methods that this prescribes. It's probably the greatest achievement that I performed for anybody. And it revolutionized how people fly airplanes. Anybody. Uh, in detail. Uh, An industry comes into existence, and you do what the other fellow did. It seemed to work for him. You adopted, it and it seems to work for you. The Wright brothers didn't have that advantage, and uh, as a result, we carried on for years habits that we had developed almost from the Wright brothers, but not quite. And everybody had contributed to it. Stall landings, we called them. You come in to, to land, and during that landing descent, you hadn't yet set the airplane up for the landing, really. But we didn't realize this. The year down, everybody did that. They did that. They put the landing gear down. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> we all agree that works. <laughs> but beyond that, they used flaps any old way they wanted to. 
they used horsepower any old way they wanted to. So when they were coming in for the descent to the landing, there was nothing that was stabilized. Yeah. It was all over the place. And everybody did it that way. And I did it that way. Until I finally tumbled to the fact that this isn't right. And so I wrote the articles and, and I just had this made to give one to you. Oh, thank uh, you. So when you take it home, you can play it or I will. Or whatever you want. It'll be an important addition to our library. But it, it will show you how much we had to learn to finally get down to the practical of just how should we do it. Right. And uh, in other words, we we did the stall landing for years. I did it. Everybody did it. That's the way they did it. They, they come in and they, they'd put more flaps down if they wanted to slow the airplane down, or they'd take some off while they were coming in on the approach. Of course, they, they put the gear down. The gear down that was done back there. But these other things they kept pulling with all the way into the landing in order to have the right speed at the landing point. And uh, everybody did it that way. Wally folks did it that way. Everybody did. Uh, How did you develop uh, your method? Did you experiment with it until you found the right way to do it, or? I guess it, some wheels were turning up here all the time, and then finally I. Uh, I tumbled to the fact, this is no way to do it. That the way you should do it is establish your drag far out. Get that over with. The landing gear down, put down the wing flaps that you want at the landing. Don't jerk them all the way down. Put Put them down like you want them when you roll on the runway. And uh, then I tumbled to the fact that I'm, if I'm doing an instrument landing, I can't do it this old way. It's got to be, everything's got to be stabilized in order to do an instrument landing. Come in on instruments, see. Right. You don't see the ground, you don't. And, uh, and that's where we were headed to, toward the instrument landings. So, I rely, I tumble to the fact that uh, we were just making hard work out of something that should be rather simple. So, here's what it meant. Here's what it meant. In my town, the Navy, well, I, I, I jumped to the line. I won't, I'll come back. The Navy had the worst system that I had ever seen in my life of how to come in and land on a carrier. Of course, they put the hook down. That's done far out. You know, that's not a part of the problem, maybe. But then, how did they do this? They had a flagman on the carrier using semaphores. 
to signal to the pilot that's coming with it in with his airplane the same to land. But he's too fast. Certain signal meant you're too fast, slow down a little bit. Another signal meant that you're either too low or whatever, you know. Oh. So how did they know? They were just going by sight? Yeah, they watched him, you see. Uh-huh. Well, what happens this is what happened to a friend of mine. He got waved off. Uh, uh, for whatever reason, the, the uh, controller on the, on the deck waved him off, but he didn't have enough air speed to, to be waved off. And he went in the water. He lost his leg. He had a wooden leg. Cleared up to the hip. He was lucky to be alive at all. But that happened over and over. It didn't happen just once. It happened over and over again. And this stopped it. This system. Stabilized everything, and the pilot was in control, and not some flagman somewhere. Right. Out, trying to outguess the pilot. You know. Yeah. Well, I'm telling you things that that make somebody else mad. You know. Oh. Right. No, I think it was really important what it, you did because it saved a lot of lives. Oh. Uh, that the Navy had to change. Yeah. It was frightful. And, uh, but anyway, and my buddy lost his leg and he, he go around town with his wooden leg. Uh, and it was all needless loss. So you see, you see that on here. It's part of Purdue history. Very important part of Purdue history. It is. Oh, sure, it's Purdue history. Yeah. yeah. Well, I read once that you landed a B-17 backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Could you tell us about that? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny thing? Remember the funny things. <laughs> the ridiculous thing. <laughs> Yes. 
Minnesota uh, at their anger at the, uh, not at St. Paul, but across the river from St. Paul. Many of us, many of us there. And uh, when we, uh, they, they, they had the temperature down 34 below zero in the hangar, and we knew that was very difficult to maintain, to do their experimenting. And they asked us if we could get an airplane down to them. So they wanted to, to, to hold, uh, hold that temperature, that, that chart. Anyway, Gordy and I headed out and got over Sioux City. I called in to see what the landing conditions would be at, at uh, uh, Minneapolis. Minneapolis. And they said that there weren't any landing conditions, that there were no landings. It was completely iced over. They had had a, a drizzle or something, and they, say, they said that the airport was completely iced over. Well, we thought about that for a moment or two. Then I realized what we could do. Uh, and uh, I, I decided we'd go on. We would land. And uh, <clears throat> that was totally unexpected on their part. <laughs> so they had people standing outside to watch them. <laughs> Did they try to keep you from landing? No, 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 they didn't. They didn't. They needed the machine. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I just, we just came in and landed on the icy runway, and uh, then uh, I cut back the outboard engines on the one side because the newer is going to slide. And it, it just slid around and as easy as you never saw. You never saw anything easier in your eye. And when it got completely turned around, I put the power back on again, see. And uh, it came to stop. So we taxied in. Were you scared at all or just, no. just fun? That's fun. <laughs> We knew we could do it. <laughs> but, That's amazing. <laughs> but we, we didn't want to dry ground. Yeah. That's the point. We didn't want to dry ground. Well, did you ever have any moments when you were testing planes or flying planes where you were in a dangerous situation? Oh, yeah. Were there ever times when you weren't sure how it was going to turn out? Or? Uh, I'm not sure about that. At least I thought I was sure. I guess you have to have a lot of confidence in yourself to fly planes like that. Well, and uh, uh, do things that are logical. As long as they're logical, uh, you're probably not taking much of a chance. Uh, It's a, it's a, it's fun. Gosh, <laughs> it was great fun. <laughs> I'd love to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I heard it was on the front page of the newspaper, landed a B-17 backwards. <laughs>
believe how many things you've done in your life because you also you also combated forest fires. You also tried to put out forest fires from the air. Oh yeah, well that came later. Okay, how did you get into that? Uh, because uh, my flying time was up with the airlines. Oh, uh huh. And I was an airplane man, you know. I couldn't quit. So I, I, I bid on some airplanes, but the military were surplusing, and I got them. Good. <laughs> and they were good ones. Good. And uh, all right, so then we equipped them in different configurations to do different kind of jobs. And one of them was uh, doing. Uh, Beetle work in the forest, chemical. And um, another one was uh, fixed up for fire ant to help help uh, alleviate the fire ant problem. So that required different equipment. And uh, uh, then then we put borate tank in the airplane, thousand gallons in this airplane. The, let's see. Oh, 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 it's here. Just so you know what airplane we're talking about. Is it in the book or is it out? I, I don't know. <laughs> Where it's liable to pop up. But there's the airplane. Oh, okay. Oh, but uh-huh. This is... That's the airplane. Type of airplane. What kind is that? That's a Lockheed PV-2. Okay. And it's an excellent airplane. Excellent. Great. It had the best engines that Pratt & Whitney ever built. And, uh, so we tanked it, you see, with a thousand gallons of slurry, and slurry is, uh, the, the slurry is uh, fertilizer, Fertil- fertilizer and water. That's what the forests, the regular drops are. Okay. That's the material they use. And uh, so we equipped one or we equipped two or three of these with tanks. So you press a little switch, you switch to arm it up here in the cockpit, and then you another switch to make the drop. So press a button. I forgot which which it is. Is that what you used for the fires? Yeah. Yeah, forest fire. Okay. Yeah. So were you on call for that? Whenever there was a fire, were you on call for it? Uh, that's a contract. Oh, uh-huh. Uh, like, this, we had the uh, fire, uh, 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 an airplane on patrol up at White River. Uh, That's the Indian Reservation mm-hmm. up here. We had that for some years. And, uh, and then some other places too, because we had two or three of these. Well, I had a wonderful mechanic. And I did all the designing, and he would build it. He, he, he loved to make things, and he was good at it, and whatever, so whatever the job called for, we'd modify the airplane to do it, oh. and that's, that's just, that's just inherited engineering mm-hmm. type of thing. Mm-hmm. 
But anyway, it was very useful and a lot of fun. Well, um, I also read that you were involved with the legislature in Wyoming. Yeah. That's amazing. How did you get involved with that? Well, you go house to house. <laughs> Drumming up business, huh? <laughs> were there particular issues that you were interested in as part of the legislature oh, yes. that were important to you? My family has always been interested in legislative matters. Oh, really? Yeah. Did you have some uh, relatives who also were involved? My father and mother were. Oh, uh -huh. Even in those days, they were very interested in what was going on. But newspapers was all they had. They didn't, didn't have radio, didn't have telephone. We had telephone, but that wasn't used for that purpose. Okay. Well, um, I just have two questions left. Uh, the first one is, looking back on your life, would you change anything? Probably, but in only little degrees. It was wonderful. Uh, life was tough. We were farm people. There were ten of us children. I remember one time when we had scarlet fever. Everyone except my love mother and myself had scarlet fever. And uh, the way we solved it, provided for them, was that mother would make a very nutritious ice cream. Of course, I would have to milk the cows and all that and make cream and do all the chores and so on. But uh, uh, so we brought them through that siege where they were all down uh, with ice cream, essentially. But it was very nutritious nutritious ice cream. Uh, it had eggs in it. It had uh, uh, pineapple. It had uh, gelatins. It, had, it, it was, it was a, a food, really. That's good. <laughs> it was a food. Yeah. And delicious. Sounds really good. It was her own recipe. She was a lovely person. Did you ever come down with scarlet fever? No. You didn't? No. Wow. I've been extremely fortunate. I didn't even have the mumps. Wow. Did you? No. I think I did. Did you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think most kids got them. Yeah, they did. The, oh, I grew up in the 50s. Yeah. yeah. Especially if you had the tonsils. I had mine removed while I was in the military. Oh, did you? Mm -hmm. Well, I just have one last question, and that is, if you could leave the students at Purdue a message, what message would it be? What would you say to students at Purdue today? Yes, 
they're your future. Did you ever use the library when you were a student? I suppose. <laughs> Do you remember anything about the library then? <laughs> no, I don't. Not particularly. I'm, I'm just curious. I was just curious if you ever used it. Well, uh, making a living was a big part of my life at that time. Just existing. Right. And your folks went through that too. They, I'm sure they found it tough. Well, it must have been really frightening to be graduating college in the Great Depression when, you know, the jobs are not there, you know. Well, we were sort of used to hard times. It wasn't any real change. You'd already been prepared to face whatever came. It, it, it hadn't been easy any time. But uh, a wonderful family, wonderful parents, wonderful horses. <laughs> Those are important, too. <laughs> Thank you so much for letting us interview you. This has been really enjoyable. I've really enjoyed learning about your life a little more. Oh. And I know. I got a lot more stories. I know. I, I think I could probably talk to you all day, but I don't want to take up your whole day. But I'll go ahead. Then. They accepted the first delivery of the jet powered airplane, whether it was a DC-8 or what, I don't, uh, I don't recall, because it was be ha being handled through Denver. That's the training center was in Denver. Uh, somehow, the pilot uh, in making a landing with it, they just got it. Just got it. Uh, Boeing didn't teach them much on how to fly the airplane. They just made them. And so they apparently didn't have much instruction, so they flew as they always did. Their old habits <laughs> prevail. Well, I, uh, when I came to the, to the landing and he powered back with the jet engines, I guess he thought, thought I was going too fast or something. And then made the sad discovery that when you put the bar back on, it takes time for it to spool up again. To in increase RPMs enough to build up pressure in the system. And so the airplane was damaged. And, uh, and the very man that flew it happened to say, I don't know how it happened. I wasn't there, so I don't know. I'm just conjecturing with you. He said, well, if you had done it the way Johnson's uh, movie said, we wouldn't have had this, <laughs> this problem. He, and he was the one that had it. But it brought home the fact 
that there are ways you must adhere to our trouble can come about and, and I guess uh, most, most of the things that I have done are just mere logic just reasonably good logic probably so it's, uh, it's interesting so you're saying the methods that you came up with for landing the planes that translated for all, for all the different planes you know when they came up with jet planes it was the same doesn't make any yeah. difference That's and world, worldwide it's accepted I've read that. I, I know that that's true. Yeah. I've also read that you came up with the system for um, for the co-pilot checklist. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I made uh, hundreds of those. Well, the pictures are here. But where are they? I've got some photos in here. Go through things and show oh, I know. Wait, wait a minute. I want to give you this, too. Oh, wonderful. Oh. Didn't I? Huh? Yeah. There, here's a list of some of the things I wrote. And I didn't write that. Billy Walker wrote that. Okay. Billy Walker. Him? Is he Purdue? No. No. Okay. No. The uh -huh. name just sounds familiar. Yeah. Well, he's quite a special fella. He's a wonderful fella. In aviation, he, he has knowledge of, uh, of people. And there's, there's the instrument, coordinator instrument. And that's mounted up in the cockpit. They, so the checklist is visible day and night. That's a real stat there. Mm -hmm. So they get any intensity of light they want. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. Do you have a copy of your, your resume or your CV that we could have? Do you have a copy of a resume or a CV that we could have for our files? So it's probably as close as you get to it, I bet you. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is really good. <laughs> yeah. A friend of mine has this friend. He has all that material. Oh, he does? Okay. Well, I, I could tell him. I'd love to get a copy of it if we could, because we we want to start files on you in our library. He wrote this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's some facts about your life mm -hmm. and accomplishments. Now this maybe is maybe it has a lot of what you want because it's oh here's some good some dates for your awards and things that's good on this article too do we have this article I have that one that's, okay. that's one of the ones I use okay this has got some Good. You have this whole thing? Mm hmm You do? We do have that. Yeah. Well, here is a copy. Oh. So okay. you can have it. Oh, okay. It. Do you want to have it? Sure. The actual That'd copy? be great. Okay. Super. Is, is this for us? Is this, is this for us? Were you giving this to yeah. us? Yeah. Okay. Oh, Thank wonderful. you. This is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Uh, 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 my niece called me on the telephone, and what's in here about me, it's all been transmitted by telephone. 
She's a wonderful person. Was she surprised that it's all of your accomplishments? I don't know. See, her father, her father is McBride. The, oh. other, the other one that she cites in here. Okay, oh. okay, so this is about you and her father. Yeah. Oh. oh. Okay. And this is, um, how, how is he related? Uh, he'd be his brother-in-law. That's, okay. Who's that? That's Ruth's brother. Yeah. Oh, McBride. Oh, okay. yeah. Richard McBride. That, that is, you said that Ruth's brother? Yeah, is that what you said? No. Okay, this is yeah. your sister's husband? That's it. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Mm -hmm. Are any of your brothers and sisters living? We just lost a sister. Yes, we have. We have a sister living. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. okay. Joy, she's, she, she uh, lives in San, San Francisco. And your brothers are all gone? Your brothers are gone now? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Is this one of your scrapbooks? Oh, I've got them scrapbook. <laughs> this is Billy Walker's father. Oh, uh-huh. He, he and I were buddies. And finally he couldn't see. His eyes failed. So that took him out of airplanes. But he was making knife blocks, you know. It was, and you put your knives in like this mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to hold your various knives. Mm -hmm. Make a guess how many of those he made and gave away. Twenty-five? Seven hundred and eighty something. Oh my! And the last two hundred of them, I I made. Wow! Because he couldn't see. Yeah, that's nice. I uh, I say two hundred. I wasn't probably wasn't quite two hundred, but I made. Because what happened was we were we were close. To the family are very close. She is still living. Oh, uh huh. But he, he's like long gone. And uh, but uh, wherever they were, they made a dent in things. For instance, he knew the athletic director oh. here. Huh. Uh, it's a popular name known in this country, down here, Cush. And I remember one time when Cush was having a hard go of it because they'd lost a game or two. And he made a cake, big cake, and he and I took it over and to Cush's office and gave it to me. <laughs> 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 That's nice. <laughs> did, they, did they start doing better after that? I guess. Well, that uh, people are not. He made, and he called me up in the morning, and he'd say, uh, you're, late, you're late for work. <laughs> That's all he'd say. <laughs> he has the saw, you know. He has the tools there. And uh, I'd go over and... So he, he meant working for him. I was there. <laughs> 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 you made for work. <laughs> you had all that experience making 
those wooden toys already. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that different, was it? <laughs> what, was, what was his name? That was Billy Walker's father. Billy Walker. His name was Billy also? Dillard. Oh, Dillard. Dillard. Uh -huh. Dillard. Dillard Walker. And he, everywhere he went, he was known. Pick, the new name is Pick. P-I-C.
you know, is your family, uh, do you have family members who are, would want to keep things like this, or would these things be things that you would be comfortable letting go of eventually? Well, my aunt, I don't think they're going to, you see, they know all this, and. Now, do you have, you have a daughter, do you have other children as well? Yeah. Okay. Grandchildren. Grandchildren. Uh -huh. Okay. Just one daughter? Uh, we lost our daughter. Oh. That's what her, uh, but, uh.
So if we had a Ralph Johnson collection, they might use that collection also to learn about aviation and, you know, how these standards were developed. You know, that's really important. It's an important step in flight history. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that, that documents your story as well as it makes Purdue famous as well. Well, this, this is now the way the world does it. And it didn't do it that way before. Yeah. Did you establish this in 41? Is that the year that you established this? Yes. Okay. Uh, I probably, I had probably established it before, but... You've been coming up with it. But recorded it. Yeah. Do you think that your Purdue education, how do you think your Purdue education helped you in your life? Oh, everything helps you. I was just wondering if, if having a Purdue engineering education helped you develop a methodical, uh, methodical scientific thinking method. If it did, it, you probably didn't know it. Uh -huh. That's probably true of all your students. Uh -huh. you, they don't realize that they're getting something. Yeah. That the process they're going through is helping to create that mindset and that type of thing. Yeah. And the things that they have to master today compared with what I had to master, my gosh, it's a new world. This has been fun for me. <laughs> Us too. <laughs> really enjoy this. I was afraid you were lost for a while. <laughs> well, we were a little worried ourselves <laughs> for a little while. <laughs> Our map wasn't quite as reliable as we had hoped, but we that, were we were relying on directions from the computer. <laughs> sharing them with various people. So we wouldn't want to, you know, 
take anything that you still want to use and, and want to to have available. My goodness. Well, I, I don't think that... We don't want to, you know, we don't want to push. We really came for the yeah. oral history. 